The wisdom of God is the revelation that the pathway to glory is the Calvary Road, both for the Messiah and for you. So what does the wisdom of God reveal about the transformative power of Christ crucified? That's the question John Piper answers from 1 Corinthians 2, 14 to 16 in this episode of Light and Truth. This sermon was originally preached at Bethlehem Baptist Church on February 14, 1988. What does he do in verses 6 following? He corrects, first of all, a misimpression, a possible false impression. What would that be? Well, he has assaulted wisdom violently in these first verses of this book. Let me show you. Verse 17, Christ did not send me to preach with eloquent wisdom. Verse 20, where is the wise man? Verse 21, the world did not know God through wisdom. Verse 22, Jews demand signs, Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ. Verse 26, not many of you were wise. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. Verse 1 of chapter 2, I didn't come proclaiming to you the testimony of God in lofty words of wisdom. Verse 4 of chapter 2, my words were not in plausible words of wisdom. So wisdom is clearly taking it on the chin in these verses, right? The false impression would be there's no place for wisdom in the Christian life. And Paul knows he's created that impression. And therefore he says in verse 6, Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom. Although it is not a wisdom of this age. And then in verse 7 he says it's a hidden or in mystery, he re- reveals a wisdom of God. In verse 13, if you want to drop down there, it says, We impart this, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit. So Paul is distinguishing two kinds of wisdom, right? A wisdom that he rejects called the wisdom of this age in verse 6, and the human wisdom in verse 13, and the wisdom that he asserts is the wisdom of God in verse 7. Now, let's ask a few questions about this wisdom. Let's ask where it comes from and what is it? What's the content of it, all right? Where does it come from? Second half of verse 7. He says that this wisdom is what God decreed before the ages for our glory, what God decreed before the ages. And then verse 9, he says that no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor has it ever entered up into the heart of man. That's the literal translation. What God prepared for those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Let's paraphrase Romans 8, verse 28. Verse 10 says, God has revealed this to us through the Spirit. So there's no basis for boasting, is there? The wisdom comes from God. That's the answer to the first question. God decreed the wisdom. We didn't get it by what we saw. We didn't get it by what we heard. And we didn't get it by thinking it up in our hearts. God revealed this wisdom through inspiration to his apostles who now teach it in words taught by the Holy Spirit. And you can't boast in a gift, can you? Well, you might think you can. Sometimes little children try to on Christmas morning. I got a better present than you got, which is a very grave thing to say. In Paul's mind, you can't boast in a gift. Look at chapter 4, verse 7. Second half of the verse, chapter 4, verse 7, it says, What do you have that you did not receive? And if then you received it, why do you boast as though it were not a gift? So it's obvious that in Paul's mind, 
It's absolutely inconsistent to boast in gifts. They are free. They're not owing to anything you can boast in. So Christian wisdom is in that category. The source of it is God, and therefore he is still trying to remove the foundation for boasting, isn't he? Where or what is it now? That was the first question. Where did it come from? Second question, what is this wisdom? Two definitions I've seen in this text so far. Let's go back to the very seminal verses 23 and 24 of chapter 1 for the first definition of wisdom. Chapter 1, verse 23 and 24, over against the wisdom of the world, he, which, which stirs up boasting in our lives. He says, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, the power of God, and here it is, the wisdom of God. So how would you define the wisdom of God from those two verses? I would define it as Christ crucified, or the preaching of the cross. So that's one definition of of the wisdom of God. Here's another one. Chapter 2, verses 7 and 9. In verse 7, God decreed this wisdom before the world for our glory. There's something about the pathway to glory that is the wisdom of God. Or look at verse 9, almost the same thing in different words. It says that no eye has seen this wisdom, no ear has ever heard it, no man ever dreamed it up, and then he defines it. What God has prepared for those who love him. So in verse 7, it's the decree of our glory and how to get there. And verse 9, it is the unimaginable, undream upable glory Promise to those who love God. Now, we've got two definitions. Let's bring them together and see if we can make sense out of this. Chapter 1, definition from verse 23 and 24. Christ crucified, the preaching of the cross, is the wisdom of God and the power of God. Chapter 2, verse 7 and 9. The wisdom of God is the pathway to glory, and it is an unimaginably great destiny decreed by God for all his people. Now let's put them together. What's the relationship between these two? Verse 8, I think, is probably the best conjunction of these two definitions. None of the rulers of this age understood this wisdom of God. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. There's the conjunction. The cross And glory. Now, what is the wisdom of God? Let me try a a sentence on you that sums it all up. The wisdom of God is the inheritance of an unimaginably glorious future with God obtained by means of a pride shattering faith in a bloody, Weak, foolish, crucified Jewish teacher who is none other than the Lord of glory. Or to put it another way, the wisdom of God is the revelation that the pathway to glory is the Calvary road, both for the Messiah and for you. That's the wisdom of God, which men regard as foolishness and weakness. That's the context of our text today, verses 14 to 16. Paul has stressed in verses 9 to 13 of our text, which we looked at last Sunday night, that the wisdom of God is a gift. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit by revelation to the minds of the apostles, taught to us in words taught by the Holy Spirit. And we dare not boast in it at all. But might we not boast in the ability to recognize it as wisdom and receive it? You see, there are a lot of people who are willing to say salvation is a gift. Revelation is a gift. 
The wisdom of God is a gift in general. But many of those very same people will say, I must preserve for myself the moral ability to recognize that wisdom and receive it on my own. And therein lies another foothold for boasting. What's wrong with you? Can't you see? I saw. Get as smart as me. The longer I've studied these verses 14, 15, and 16, the more I have become persuaded that the reason Paul wrote them was to remove that foothold for boasting. These verses teach us, as we'll see in a moment, that not only is the wisdom of God a gift in general by virtue of revelation and inspiration, but it is a gift in particular by virtue of the fact that Only by the power of the Holy Spirit can we recognize it and receive it. Verse 13, at the end, do you see the phrase, interpreting spiritual truths to those who possess the Spirit or literally to spiritual persons, spiritual ones? The spiritual truth is no doubt there the wisdom of God and the revelation of God. And the implication of that verse seems to be that there's only a group of people who are going to receive this. There's only a group of spiritual people who are going to accept the interpretation that the apostle has to give of the wisdom of God. And that's exactly what verses 14 to 16 were written to confirm and to explain. So let's look at these verses. Verse 14, the unspiritual man does not receive the gifts of the Spirit of God. Or more literally, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. Who's a natural man? A natural man is a man without the Holy Spirit. A natural person is a person who is merely human. In fact, next Sunday's message is entitled, The Danger of Being Merely Human. As mere humans, we have no divine work within us, no special enabling grace, no ministry of the Holy Spirit. We have one birth, our physical birth. And as such, Paul says here, we do not receive Spiritual truth. We will not. We do not esteem it. We do not value it. We reject it. Why? The next phrase in the text tells us why. For these truths are folly or foolishness to the natural man. Now that word foolishness ought to ring about five bells in your head if you've been here for the past four weeks. It's all over the place in chapter 1. He's never left the foolishness of the cross. Verse 18, chapter 1. The word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Verse 23. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, and foolishness to Gentiles. It's the same word as we have right here in verse 14. If you want to know what the spiritual things are that a natural man regards as folly, all you do is go back a few verses and read cross, cross, cross. It's the word of the cross. It's the statement that to glory you have to walk the Calvary road. This is the folly that a natural man sees, according to verse 14, rejects. But that's not all. There's something worse here. There's a bondage, a terrible bondage, isn't there? Verse 14 continues, He is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned or spiritually assessed. 
Now I want you to notice the ominous shift from the does not receive them to the cannot understand them. That's ominous. That's frightening. That's bondage. Apart from the Holy Spirit, which constitutes us as spiritual, our moral character is so proud, so hard, so rebellious against the cross of Christ and the summons to die there that it cannot see it. We have moved from a will not to a cannot. That is the bondage of moral blindness. But take note, moral blindness rooted in rebellion does not free from moral accountability. Moral blindness rooted in rebellion does not free you from being responsible to believe, to see the beauty of the cross, which it is. Because the only thing holding a natural man back is pride. And pride does not remove accountability. So at the end of verse 14, what do we see? That the things of the Spirit of God are spiritually discerned or assessed. What does that mean? It means that we have to have the Holy Spirit transforming our character, humbling us, freeing us from our rebellion and our pride so that we are able to own up to the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ hanging on the cross. Without the Holy Spirit taking the irrational bondage of pride away from us, we will not own up to it. And mark this, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is never to make you do one thing you don't want to do. All that the Holy Spirit does is take the muscle man of pride who's holding you captive and blinding you with the irrational impulses of boasting and rebellion, and he slays him and frees you to be reasonable and recognize glory when you see it and beauty when you have it. The only free people in the world are people who have been liberated from the bondage of the irrational impulses of human Pride. What's the difference between a natural man and a, and a spiritual man? Let's go back to those seminal verses in chapter 1 again. Verse 23 and 24. The words natural and spiritual do not occur in these two verses. But I want you to ask the question as I read them. What's the watershed between the natural man and the spiritual man in these two verses? We preach Christ crucified, stumbling block to Jews, folly to Gentiles. That's the response of the natural man, right? But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. There's the response of the spiritual man. What's the watershed? What's the division? The call of God, right? Those who are called see. So they're the spiritual ones. So what constitutes you as spiritual is the call of God in your life. And this is so helpful for me to see because I want to see the harmony and the unity of Scripture And I know from the Gospel of John, for example, that you have Jesus, the Good Shepherd, calling people. The sheep hear His voice. They recognize it and they follow Him. That's the call of God into His fellowship. But back in chapter 3, it said, The wind blows where it wills. 
The Spirit blows where He wills. and Nobody knows where it comes from or where it's going to. And so are all who are born by the Spirit. Born of the Spirit, called by the shepherd, are exactly the same reality. And so it was delightful. It is beautiful. It is affirming to see in this writer you have in chapter 1 the call of God separating those who can see and those who can't see. And you have in the second chapter the division called spiritual and natural, meaning Holy Spirit driven and those left in the rebellion of their evil hearts. Verses 15 to 16, we can just perhaps pass over with a brief paraphrase as we close to describe who this spiritual person is. Let's read these. Verse 15, the spiritual man, that is the person changed by the Spirit, called into fellowship by the Spirit, Judges all things. What does that mean? I think it means he approves and assesses correctly all the things of the Spirit revealed by the apostles and in their writings. In other words, he forms right judgments about the truth of Scripture and about the truth of spiritual realities. Second half of the verse, but he himself is judged by no one, that is, rightly assessed by no one, that is, the natural man doesn't any more understand a spiritual man than the man in the moon. And that makes perfectly clear sense because if the natural man looks at the cross and and the Calvary road leading to glory and sees only folly and foolishness and has not attracted in the least, then if he looks at somebody who loves the cross, who's on the way to glory and loves Christ, who stakes his whole life on the cross, that man will be a blank a conundrum, a riddle, a mystery. I think that's what it means when it says the spiritual man is not judged, that is rightly judged or assessed by anybody. And then finally, verse 16, the reason is a question for who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him, and you have to always turn rhetorical questions into statements. So the statement is, for no one, No natural man, no one without the assistance of the Holy Spirit has ever penetrated the mind of God. And that's exactly what verse 11 says, if you want to go back up for confirmation of that. Second half of verse 11 says, No one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Without the Spirit of God, we don't know God. But... And then the verse ends, there is a people who by virtue of the work of the Holy Spirit and the call of God in their lives have been granted to be liberated from the monstrous, enslaving bondage of pride. They have been broken by the word of the cross. The eyes of their hearts have been opened And like the sun coming up on a new morning after a long, dark night, the cross is radiant with the glory of God and draws them in and they embrace it freely as the hope of their lives and the love of their Valentine affection. This is Light and Truth, God-centered preaching to help you see Christ clearly and treasure Him truly. I'm your host, Dan Kruver. Thank you for listening. On our next episode, John Piper will preach on the Christian life as warfare in our series titled, The Transforming Power of the Cross. I hope you'll join us. For more resources, visit desiringgod.org.